Last week was Bill come up after the service. Anything you got, Angela? Uh, Bill come up after the service because it was um, it didn't go according to script, our script. And uh, he says, what are you going to title this? I said, well, impromptu sermon number one. And that left us with then this one. And we're talking about the resurrection, talking about it from 1 Corinthians 15, which is basically a chapter that sheds light on the resurrection. The first 11 verses is Paul put together witnesses of Jesus' resurrection as proof. In the next verses, uh, 12 through 19, it talks about those that say there isn't a resurrection or might not be a resurrection or, or, or. Have you ever heard questions like that? Uh, for you and I, we have chosen life, not death. And that is a choice. You must choose life. And you must come to the recognition that the resurrection truth stands alone. The question then, and we'll come across it in one of the verses that we'll read, is how say you that, there's, that there be no resurrection of the dead? The quest for emotional security is strong. And in some people, they're willing to accept a philosophy or a religion on the ground that it does them some good. They say, whether they're fully convinced of the authenticity or not, but it's very important how we face the all-important doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This truth, as we've already said, stands alone. Jesus is the only one to die and be resurrected, never to die again. He predicted that he would raise from the dead. Did he or didn't he? Yes, I heard. If he did, he was all that he claimed to be. Now get that. We need to settle on that. If he rose from the dead, he is all that he claimed to be. His promises are yes and amen forever. Right? Right. All right. We are not to limit the resurrection. Yet some seek for an anchor that meets their requirements of personal investment and involvement. They have established personal limits no matter what truth is. For these, spiritual life must fall within their parameters, never accepting there's only one spiritual truth concerning the resurrection. Choose this day, this standalone truth, and Jesus is the only one that can make the claim, I am the resurrection. I am the life. I have included in here a home Bible study again, but this time I included it at this point, not the end. Are you going to go into it? No. I'm just going to read the highlights of it. Uh, in this chapter, Paul states that the physical body is natural, earthly, flesh and blood, terrestrial, corruptible, sown in dishonor, sown in weakness, mortal, soulish, he also said is vile and the body of our humiliation. Through the resurrection, there is a transformation. And this resurrected body is to be redeemed, quickened, made alive, fashioned, changed, put on, raised, spiritual, heavenly, celestial, incorruptible, powerful, immortal, and glorious. All right? For you... As born-again children of God, this is our expectation. Yet that life is already in us. So we'll begin today. Uh, let's, let's just look at this resurrection from the viewpoint as the Word of God gives it to us. Have you ever noticed, this is, have you ever noticed what you believe is not necessarily the truth? Ever happened to you? 
Huh? Have you ever had to change your mind? Have you ever seen the Spirit of God bring truth to you that made you change? Absolutely. If it hasn't happened to you, it should have happened to you in all expectation. Sometimes you just have questions. It just is not palatable. And sometimes when you keep facing the same things over again, it may take a bit. I'm looking at somebody in particular. I was, not now. Sometime I'm going to ask a, a person, what is it that made us so odd? <laughs> is your pastor odd? Oh, well, okay. I've had him stand right in front of me and tell me, you're different. That's not here, okay? You're different. It's not normal. Are we supernatural beings or not? If we've been born again, <laughs> if we have now his life abiding in us, should it not mean something? Should it not have an outward expression? Absolutely it should have. Absolutely. Well, okay. But verse 12, saying this. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you, among you, that there is no resurrection of the dead? How can you say that? He's asking them. Now, from what I can find and what I've heard, the only people who would not be in favor of the resurrection from the dead is those who know they're going to face the judgment. Because the result of physical death, the next thing on the agenda at some point will be a judgment. Verse 13, I will hasten on. If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Like I said, this, this is all rationale from, a, from my standpoint of a little negative. I have difficulty with negative. Maybe you've noticed. I'd far rather bring it out in a positive fashion, so live with that in mind. Let's see where we go with this. Now, living in darkness, those living in darkness have their activity inspired by the rulers of the darkness would hope that there be not a resurrection. Not only is the resurrection the foundation stone of Christianity, is it, a basis, it is the basis on which we believe in a judgment to come. Okay? The judgment to come is no harder to believe in than the resurrection would have been before it occurred. Christ promised both. The fulfillment of his promise concerning the one is the guarantee of the fulfillment of the other. So let's read what John 12, 47 has to say to us. If any man hear my words and believe not, did you see those next words? Caught my attention. Does it catch yours? I judge not. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. I judge not. I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world. Is this how we've always looked at Jesus? Or have we been hammered on the negative side so long that that is our response? I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Wow, sozo the world. Amongst those is to make whole the world. John 8, 15 says this. Ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man. Is that what he says, Wug? That's what he says. Now, how do I balance that? Then there's a time change. An appointed day comes after his promised resurrection. Acts 17, 31. Let's read what this has to say. 
because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Okay, so he does not judge. He does not judge. Now he says he, at an appointed day, he will judge the world. And he will judge it in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whether he hath given assurance, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. The insurance that this happens, will happen, is that his resurrection. That's his guarantee. Because he rose from the dead, he will judge. All right? But it's at an appointed time, an appointed day, an appointed place. Not in his, he didn't come to judge. He came to offer us himself in our place as payment. All right? Wow. He became the guarantee. Jesus qualifies for judicial authority, but only after man's resurrection. We could go to Revelations 20 and look at that. There cannot be salvation apart from Jesus' resurrection. Romans 10, 9. This is familiar. Look at this. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, believe what in your heart? that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The resurrection is a fundamental key. As well as the cross is a key, resurrection is a key. It's a fundamental truth. Believing that, thou shalt be saved. Amongst those things, again, it's worthwhile looking up, uh, Sozo, to get the definitions and amongst them is healed and so on, but the last one, strong concordance use, is made whole. Made whole. Made whole. Wow. Verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, futile, empty, false, fruitless. The key, Holman's key Bible words of vain is something like this. Without content and without resurrection, no confirming supernatural manifestation. Vain. Without content and without force, without life or living. In reality, the word cannot create life without resurrection, life, and power. Okay? And your faith is also vain. Futile, empty, false, fruitless. If God, let's take these in bites now. If God be not risen, then is your preaching vain. Because one, I have six different things here and I will go through them quickly. Because first, Christianity is fellowship with a real person who is alive. We experience this fellowship every day. Two, forgiveness of sins are obtained through Christ himself. If Jesus did not raise from the dead, he cannot give salvation to us, because it is life. However, he did raise from the dead. Now he lives forever to make intercession for us. Hebrews 7.25, he saves us to the uttermost, ever living to make intercession for us, or saved to the uttermost completely and perfectly. If preaching is vain and empty, then your faith is also vain. Item four, therefore our preaching and our faith being vain. Five, faith is the present tense ministry of Jesus, is essential to true Christianity, and would be impossible if Jesus were not alive. Without Jesus being alive, Christianity would be just another dead religion. James 2, 26. Let's look at this. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. When his spirit leaves your, your body, what are you? Dead. 
physically dead. For you and I, we go on living. We gave up a physical body to gain a, a glorious body in a time to come. John 6, 63, saying this, It is the spirit that quickeneth, or makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. And that life is Zoe, life as God has it. Spiritual life. Spirit. Breath. What did, what did, what did God breathe into Adam? Breath. He was, making, he was making man in his image. God is what? If we've read it, God is a spirit. So what did he breathe into Adam to make him like, to make Adam like him? Breathed into him spirit, and man became a living soul. <laughs> okay. Uh, think of this. Simply said, the spirit gives life to the flesh. The first thing that we experience, physical life in its beginning, and we've already stated it. Genesis 2, 7, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, God's spirit of life, and man became a living soul. God is spirit, John 4, 24. God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Genesis 1, 26 saying this, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. And some of you ladies said, Amen. I want to go back here. Which one did I get the message from? About those little things that crawl on people? You? I didn't get back to you, did I, other than, am I a failure? Oh, thank you. But let me tell you, can I tell you a story? We'll let them listen in. All right. There was a, a young boy and started out on the downside of life because when I got the text, I guess it was, that's what you call them, things, text. <laughs> this, this story flashed through my system. And this boy was uh, living in the low side of life, so to speak, didn't have anything. And they had a mud floor in this uh, country to, way to the south. And uh, just a hut. And he had problems with tarantulas. Yeah, bigger than those things you're talking about. Yeah, it's perhaps more scary than those things you were talking about. Huh? And this boy got upset with these tarantulas being in the house. Yeah. So this young boy t took it upon himself, said this, no more tarantulas forever in where we live. Huh? His dad testified they lived in that hut for a number of years later and then moved on to another home. He says we have from that day never seen another tarantula in any home they owned or lived in. See? Amen. Amen. I, that story come out of a distant past somewhere. I, I can't even tell you where I read it, but does it change the truth of the matter? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Where were we at? Every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth, that's what triggered it again. Wow. Whew. So let me read this then. God, by breathing himself, a spirit, into Adam, Adam became a living soul. The spirit gave life to the soul, and the dust and the clay, the body, rose and walked. Notice, with James, we've already read, the body without the spirit is death. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says this, that the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Interesting, isn't it? The second, physical life's conclusion. 
Then the future resurrection day, in the future resurrection day, the body will be resurrected in a new form, glorified, reunited with the believer's spirit and soul. Note, glorious as Jesus' body is glorious. Again, back to James 2, 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, without life and fruitless, so faith without works is dead, without life and fruitless. Also, James is saying, as a spirit is the life-giving part of us, likewise actions are that which gives life to our faith. Life, actions. Sixth item, Christ has risen from the dead to defeat all of God's enemies, sin, death, and the enemy, Satan. We have been saved, made whole, sharing victories with others via life-giving faith. There should be an ongoing confirmation of the gospel confirmed by signs following. True? True. Uh, if you want, look it up sometime. Uh, Mark 16, 20. False witnesses cannot dismiss the confirmed gospel because it's confirmed by Jesus Christ himself. Dramatic transformation, supernatural changes. Verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 15. Yea, and ye are found perceived as false witnesses of God because ye have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead raise not. Has anybody noticed the logic of unbelievers? Huh? <laughs> I mean, this it's, it's is astounding what they can put together in sentence form. You say, Lynn, you're pregnant. Yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> From that standpoint. Wow. If somebody thinks it's black... The other guy says it's white. If he says it's white, the other guy, first guy says it's white, then it's black. So on it goes. Logic, they don't respond to logic other than with emotion. You ever seen any of that? Let me give you an instance. The logic of the unbeliever is without truth and or experience as a foundation. Mostly it's reasoning based on emotion. A peanut cartoon Okay? A peanut cartoon has Lucy contending that snow comes up from the ground rather than falls from the sky. When Charlie Brown very reasonably asks how it gets up through the pavement, she's taken back for a moment, then angrily restorts, Did anyone ever tell you you have a funny face? Hey. Emotion. Because she could not refute the logic, she resorted to ridicule of him as a person. Yep. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, Paul says, but in power. In the Holy Ghost. This is 1 Thessalonians 1.5, so you can, we can read it together. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, in much assurance. That's full confidence, by the way, much assurance. As ye know what manner of men ye were among you for, my, for your sakes. The supernatural power of the Holy Spirit confirmed the gospel Paul taught. It's truly one reason he made great impact. So did Jesus and the disciples make great impact by the confirmed gospel. The preaching of the true gospel, again, will be confirmed with signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Ghost. Verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 15. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not risen, or raised. The cross is a symbol of Christianity, but notice, Jesus is not there. He is risen. 
He may be an object of grateful memory because he's made payment, complete payment for our sin debt. Absolutely, totally made payment for it. But only a living Christ can be the author of our salvation, the giver of eternal life. I know, you know, that this sacrifice is sufficient because Christ rose from the dead. In verse 17, we now speak of empty faith. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, empty. Ye are yet in your sins. This is the second time he's come back to this. People who base their faith in Christianity that denies the that denies the resurrection of Christ are like children playing at a tea party. You ever see them? Do you ever have a tea party? <laughs> it's hard to get him to say yes to that question. The girls did. Some guys may have been in it but surely while we were young. You ever notice? They gravely pour imaginary tea from an empty pot into an empty cup. They do it very seriously. Yeah. Uh-huh. Or they lift imaginary food to their mouths from an empty plate. I want my plate full. I want groceries on it, spiritual and physical. I want coffee in my coffee cup. I will drink tea if leaned on. Okay? But I want some. Just as I want spiritual truth at the expense. He, our Jesus, provided it. I'm going to seem to take a side trip here, but it's about the third or fourth time it's come back. And so I'm going to share it with you. Uh, being raised in a place where where tongues were not an issue. A matter of fact, and if, unless it was down. But me, I, want, I wanted what God wanted me to have. I didn't care. Anybody that lived at Stanwood could find the back way from Stanwood up and come across to the far side of Big Rapids, across the river. You can find your way through there. Uh, me, it went something like this. I started up there one spring morning, and I wanted what God wanted. I had been asked to take my seat whenever man in the congregation was asked to come sing a song. Okay? Lynn, you stay put. Okay. Yeah. So what were you doing? I was coming up there, the sun was shining, it was warm, toasty, you know, not hot. And I was just singing. I was having a great time. Nobody there to criticize my whether I was on tune or not. And then somebody else liked it. Because then I began to sing in words I had no idea what they were or where they came from exactly. All I knew was they felt good. Have you ever let logic rule you? I put down logic for a while in that car ride to Big Rapids because it kept, this is strange. This is odd. I'll even tell you what the word was. It's childish. I said, but I feel good. I mean, things were charging in me that, huh, I never, huh, I never had before. Whoop, de doo. You see, my Jesus went from the cross and he rose again that he sent back the comforter. I didn't know about this. I didn't know what happened to me, even. And finally, I said, okay, that's enough. I went back singing to English, and it was nowhere near as good. 
I didn't know what happened to me till months later or weeks later. And I said, I'm going to have this. And so I went out to the chicken coop. Yeah. There in the years of dung on the floor, I begin to say, okay, I open my mouth and wait for something to come out. Nothing come out, of course. And so I happened to, there was a window broken out, and I looked out, and I could see the sky, and I could see the trees, and that sure was pretty. And I said, I really would like to express that and put some air to it, and something happened to me again. Now then, I said, oh, I know what, that happened to me back there on that back road. Now, there you are. I just share that with you this morning because the fact of the matter is, because the resurrected Christ sent comforter back, he blessed me. I wasn't drawn from an empty cup nor an empty plate. I might have been told it was an empty cup and an empty plate, but it didn't make no difference. The truth of the matter is, it was real. I want the genuine. I'll give up the counterfeit. I want the genuine. Where are you at? I'm right here, verse 18. Wow. Uh, then they shall also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Of course, this isn't true. It would be the result if there was no bodily resurrection. There was the resurrection of Jesus, and there will be a resurrection of every person who has ever lived. Believers, according to John 8, 51 and 52. Let's see what that has to say. Verily, verily, truly, truly, surely, surely, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Notice the word see? He shall never see death. And then said the Jews unto him, now we know that you have a devil. <laughs> see? They thought he was a counterfeit. They didn't understand. Spiritual truth sometimes is, is just, it's uncomprehendable to a carnal person. All right, so what happened here? Abraham is dead, the prophets are dead, and, they, and thou sayest any man, keep my saying, he shall never, not only never see death, but he shall never taste death. That is God's promise to you and I. Are we going to physically die? Yes. But it won't look from a negative perspective. We will never see death, he promised us, and we'll never taste death because we are already alive and will be alive forever. The unbeliever is already dead, and he will continue to be dead because he didn't choose life. He didn't choose resurrection. Wow. Whew. The second death will have no bearing on us. The carnally minded didn't understand. Spiritually minded is life and peace, Romans 8, 6, and 7. Believers are alive now and forever because we are as our Savior is. All right? Verse 19 in conclusion. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable, or more to be pitied. But we have knowledge today founded upon biblical truths concerning his personal experience. For when he rose from the dead and revealed him, himself to those who saw him, now is Christ risen from the dead. We'll see it in the next chapter, next verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, where we'll probably start next week. Now is Christ risen from the dead. He was himself but the first fruits from the dead. He was the first one. I got a number, I think. You got a number. We at least, in, at least were in sequence of some sort. And he can keep it straight. All right? Isn't that amazing? But we're going to get into some of the depths of continuing with this. I think next week, if not the week after, sometime. So, Father, we give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you honor and glory. We thank you that it is in reality a past happening that you rose from the dead is with assurance we make that statement. 
and you guaranteed unto us through that death, burial, and resurrection, the guarantee that you are who you say you are, you've done for us what you say you've done, and we can trust you, and we can honor and glorify you, put our hopes and our security in you, that you will take us from where we are today to where you want us to be tomorrow and in all future tomorrows in the forever to come. We thank you for it. Praise, honor, and glory is given to you. We say thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.